Uh, welcome to our today's webinar about the uh, cyber dimension of uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine. Uh, I'm Birgi Lorenz, uh, the host today's event, and I'm from Tallinn University of Technology. The uh, video is uh, recorded and uh, may, uh, will be made available in uh, Tallinn Technical University website and uh, sent to all of you who registered. Uh, questions can be asked on the chat. Uh, first remarks before Professor Josephine Wolf speak comes from our dear partner, US Embassy, whose uh, cooperation uh, with the par uh, partner uh, Tufts University and US Speaker Program has provided uh, us this possibility. Thank you for it. Uh, Brian Burke works in the political economic section at the US Embassy in Tallinn, where he manages defense, security, and cyber related programs. Brian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Birgi. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this U.S. Speaker Series program on the cyber dimensions of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'd like to thank our hosts at Tal Tech for helping us to organize this event. As Birgi mentioned, I'm the political military and cyber officer at the U.S. Embassy in Tallinn. I'm going to talk for just a few minutes up top about the current situation in Ukraine, what we're doing about it jointly with the Estonian government and our allies and partners, and the importance of considering the cyber dimension of this conflict. All of us, I think, are increasingly horrified at Putin's unwarranted and inhumane war against Ukraine, a free and sovereign state, a peaceful neighbor, one that poses no direct threat to Russia. In recent days, Russia has expanded its attacks, intentionally targeting civilian infrastructure and buildings, encircling cities, cutting off ordinary Ukrainians' access to food, water, electricity, and health care. More than 3 million people have fled the country, and many have come under direct bombardment by Russian forces as they try to escape the inhumane conditions that Putin has created. In response, the United States, our allies and partners have taken steps to ensure the Russian government pays a severe economic and diplomatic price for its invasion of Ukraine. We've imposed strict sanctions, cut off mm -hmm. Russia from the global financial system, prevented Russian elites from laundering their ill-gotten gains, and continued to isolate the Russian economy. One week has erased 30 years of progress in integrating Russia into the world markets. It is important to remember that it doesn't have to be this way. Russia could choose to cut its losses and pursue a good faith diplomatic agreement with Ukraine, something that President Zelensky has said that he wants. And we applaud the steps the Estonian government has taken to support Ukraine throughout the crisis, providing humanitarian assistance, implementing strong sanctions against the Russian regime in cooperation with EU partners, and providing lethal aid to the courageous Ukrainian forces fighting for their country. One lesson we've drawn from this war has been the need to continue strengthening our collective defense. As President Biden has said, we will defend every inch of NATO territory. And it's obvious looking at the pictures that are coming out of Ukraine that this means defending on land, in the air, and at sea, but defense in the cyber realm is becoming increasingly vital. Our connected economies and our critical infrastructure have been and will continue to be under attack. And this is something we work very hard at at our embassy in Tallinn. We work with our Estonian partners to strengthen our collective cyber defense, attribute attacks to malign actors, and promote norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Estonia is a world leader on cyber, and we're particularly happy to see so many of you studying and working on these issues. Now I'm going to turn it over to our guest speaker, Dr. Josephine Wolf, Associate Professor of Cybersecurity Policy at Tufts University. She's an expert in cybersecurity policy, international internet governance, and the legal, political, and economic consequences of cybersecurity incidents. She'll help us understand what lessons we can draw from Russian cyber tactics in Ukraine compared with earlier attacks against Estonia and Georgia, and what this means for the future of international conflict. Dr. Wolf, welcome. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, really sort of helpful remarks to, to set the context for today. And thank you, Bergi, and everybody at Taltech. I'm so honored to be here. Um, I think that speaking to Estonians about cyber conflict is such a uh, sort of important and, and rare honor because Estonia actually plays such a central role in this space and is, is often one of the starting points when we think about what cyber conflict looks like and what the right ways to respond to it are. So I'm going to talk a little bit going back to 2007 about some of the early cyber conflict between Russia and Estonia and try to give a little bit of a historical perspective on what we've seen from Russia before, what we're seeing right now, and what kinds of conclusions we could or should be drawing about the nature of hybrid warfare, the, the role that cyber dimensions play in these types of conflicts. So the things I wanna talk about today, first of all, just broadly kind of how we think about different categories 
of cyber conflict, how we kind of divide up what different types of cybersecurity incidents look like according to the motivations of the perpetrators, according to the kind of damage that they do, and where the things that we're falling that, that we're seeing now fall along that spectrum, as well as how they differ from some of the sort of offensive cyber capabilities that we've seen from Russia or from other countries over the course of the past decade, decade and a half. Um, and I would say that's, you know, that's roughly the time frame that I'm going to, to be speaking about today is, is starting around 2006, 2007 and moving through the present. What are some of the patterns that we start to identify? And in particular, what are some of the patterns we start to identify out of Russia, which has been one of the most active states in this, this realm of using offensive cyber capabilities for a long time. Um, and I think that there's sort of interesting patterns to pick up on, but also interesting deviations that we're seeing right now in the current invasion of Ukraine that tell us some new things about what Russia may or may not be capable of in cyberspace and also what role they see these cyber conflicts as playing in the context of larger sort of traditional warfare-based conflicts as well. So we're gonna do a little bit of history. We're gonna sort of talk about Estonia. We're gonna talk about Ukraine. We're gonna talk about Georgia a little bit and the ways in which we've seen Russia use cyber capabilities in the past, um, both kind of alongside traditional forms of conflict and on their own. Um, and co a couple of things that I think are sort of interesting to pick up on here and that we're gonna, we're gonna try to explore have to do with, first of all, kind of how targeted these cyber capabilities are. So if you think back to 10, 15 years ago when people are starting to talk about cyber conflict, um, when I start researching this space, there's a strong sense that one of the things about cyber is going to be that it allows for really specific narrow targeting of offensive capabilities, um, that you're gonna be able to sort of select a, a few particular computers or a few particular networks or devices that you want to sabotage or compromise and do that in a really targeted way that avoids a lot of collateral damage, that avoids sort of a, a whole bunch of other things that might otherwise make these conflicts bigger and messier than they need to be. And one of the things that I think Russia has really challenged over the course of the past 10, 15 years has been that idea that sort of when you use cyber capabilities, they can be quieter, more covert, more targeted than traditional forms of conflict. And so I want to talk a little bit about sort of what that arc looks like for Russia, what kinds of attacks have been attributed to them over the course of the past 15 years, and how that's been different from what we've seen out of other countries, how that's been different from what we've been tracking out of China, out of North Korea, out of Iran, because I do think Russia has a sort of very unique identity in this space, in terms of the kinds of capabilities it exercises, in terms of the partnerships it has with private actors uh, in the country who are launching various kinds of cyber crime and cybersecurity incidents, and understanding kind of what that Russian profile is of, of how they wield cyber capabilities is really useful and really interesting for looking at what's happening right now and trying to make sense of it, I think. And then we're going to spend some time just sort of looking through some very recent headlines, uh, talking about the ways that Russia has been using cyber capabilities just for the past month and a half, really, um, and, and trying to kind of get a handle on how sophisticated are these capabilities, why would they make these choices as opposed to some of the other ones we've seen in the past, what kinds of conclusions are people in this space starting to draw? based on those decisions. And I, I will say, you know, right up front, and we can talk about this more as we get into the discussion in the Q&A, that everything I'm going to say to you right now about sort of the Russian use of cyber capabilities during the, the current invasion could change at any point, right? I'm, I'm going to draw some conclusions based on really just a few weeks worth of conflict. And, and there's no guarantee that the, the state of cyber conflict won't shift dramatically. But I do think we're now at the point where we've been watching this space for enough time that it is possible to sort of at least draw some preliminary conclusions about how this conflict in the cyber domain is different from some of the previous ones that we've seen out of Russia. And that doesn't mean that it couldn't escalate or worsen or, or anything else. Um, but, but we are at a point where a lot of people are saying, you know, this, this this seems a little different. This seems a little bit unusual. This is certainly not what we were expecting 
four or six weeks ago when people started to kind of worry about cyber attacks from Russia uh, in relation to this particular conflict and, and what that might look like. And so finally, I want to wrap up with sort of some, some very early ideas about what we might learn from this particular invasion about Russia's cyber strategy, right? How we might interpret this in the context of, of that historical lens that we're going to talk about in, in the lead up, and more generally, sort of beyond just Russia, though I think Russia by itself is, is a very big part of this picture, because it's been such an active country in exercising offensive cyber capabilities. But more generally, what should we be sort of thinking and learning about the ways that all countries are going to be conceiving of the usefulness of cyber attacks in the context of different kinds of international conflict and how those augment conflict, escalate or de-escalate conflict, what sorts of, of takeaways we might have for looking ahead to, as I say, sort of a space that people have been pontificating on, myself included, for, for many years and saying, you know, the future of war is going to be hybrid warfare, is going to be cyber attacks. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think you're seeing some, some people challenge that now and say, this isn't perhaps what we expected. Maybe some of our, our sort of preconceptions about reliance on cyber capabilities were a little hasty or were based not on a, a completely full picture of what those capabilities look like and how expensive they are, or how hard to exercise they are. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, I want to start, and I would start here anyway, but as I say, I feel a, a particular kind of relevance and significance of it speaking to an Estonian audience. I want to start in Estonia in 2007, right? Because when we talk about cyber war and cyber conflict between countries, this is often where we start, right? When, we, when we're teaching classes or we're, we're doing histories of cyber conflict, there's a real sense that kind of that set of distributed denial of service attacks against Estonian newspapers, Estonian websites in 2007, marks a, a real turning point for how people have been thinking about the use of offensive cyber capabilities by states. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not as targeted, it's not as focused on critical infrastructure as some of the later cyber attacks that we see out of Russia. But it is a moment when it feels like an entire country is really sort of under siege from a cyber dimension in a way that nobody's quite seen before, um, on a scale perhaps that nobody's quite seen before. And there's a lot of interest at the time in sort of how you perform attribution of this type of attack, right? How, how we make a determination of who's behind it and whether this was Russia and whether we mean by that the Russian government or individual people in Russia. And there are a lot of things about this, this particular incident that make that a little bit difficult to, to sort of unravel. If you go on to the next slide, right? I pulled some of the screenshots from the attack instructions for this particular set of denial of service attacks. So one of the sort of crucial things in performing attribution for this incident is looking at some of the Russian language directions that have been posted online um, for, for how to sort of participate in the attack. And there are a lot of people who sort of use this to say, oh, this seems like something that's, that's more informal than a Russian government sponsored attack. This seems kind of more like a, a loose coalition of people who are, coming together to bombard Estonian networks with traffic and, and take them offline. Um, and, and I would say, you know, again, thinking, thinking forward to today, we're also still seeing a lot of these same discussions and a lot of these same disagreements around how much of what we're seeing in Ukraine uh, with regards to cyber conflict is sort of run by the Russian government as opposed to more informal or more ad hoc independent parties. Um, and, and that's long been one of the issues around trying to attribute cyber attacks to Russia because there are so many kind of loose connections or in some cases not so loose connections between the government and other entities, organized crime groups, um, individuals, sort of independent hackers, that it can be hard to, to trace things back sort of very squarely to the Russian government. But this is also a moment in 2007 when Estonia is, is under attack online, when we start to see some of the kind of more formal attribution mechanisms from states kick in. And if you go on to the next slide, I took you know just a, a chunk of the statement by the Estonian foreign minister 
which is made soon afterwards, saying Russia is attacking Estonia, right? Sort of establishing one of these early statements, which we're going to see many times over in the, the following years from many other countries, in which you, you actually attribute a sort of very specific responsible party um, to, to who you sort of think has been behind this, right? From the statement, it has been established that cyber terrorist attacks against Estonian governmental institution websites and that of the president's offices have been made from IP addresses of concrete computers and by concrete individuals from Russian government organs, including the administration of the president of the Russian Federation. So when we think about kind of the, the history of countries attributing cyber attacks to other countries' governments, this is an important landmark, right? This is a moment when you have a national government saying a cyber attack directed at our entire country has come from another country. Um, and it's going to sort of a little bit be the template for a lot of the later attribution efforts that you're going to see in 2016, 2017, um, even still today, where countries are, are trying to coordinate some of this attribution activity and, and do it in a way that makes it clear and makes it somewhat unassailable, sort of, here's who was behind this. We have put together our intelligence. We have performed our own digital forensic analysis. And, and we know what we're talking about to sort of try and preempt some of the questions, some of the concerns that often come up around cyber attacks of, well, how can you ever really know for sure who was responsible for this? If we think about what happens here, right, if just to sort of wrap up our discussion of the Estonian incident, if you go on to the next slide, I pulled the, the website from Netnon, which is one of the big internet exchange points in Europe, um, and they are hugely relevant, right? So when, when we sort of look at these massive distributed denial of service attacks on Estonia, what actually happens to remediate them is you get a bunch of folks at these internet exchange points. Um, there's a guy from Netnod named Patrick Falstrom who's very involved. There are a bunch of others who are working with him from Packet Clearinghouse and other private organizations. And they essentially get on the phone with each other um, and say, you know, do you see the traffic coming into Estonia? We need to coordinate the internet infrastructure around Europe to drop all of that malicious traffic, to cut Estonia off from these attacking networks and get their, get their servers and their networks back up and running within the country. Um, that, that's a you know, quite impressive coordinated effort. It relies a lot on these informal networks of folks who know each other and work together in these private organizations that are focused on connecting different internet networks to each other, but it's largely a private response, right? The way that, that we deal with those attacks, the way that we get the Estonian networks back up and running is largely by turning to private companies that help manage internet infrastructure and having them kind of coordinate which traffic should be dropped and, and how to clear some of that massive deluge of traffic coming into Estonia. And I think that's important because it, it also sets the stage in a real way for sort of how we're going to think about who's responsible for protecting against these types of attacks, for remediating them when they happen. Um, and it gives you a sense of the historical evolution that we're going to see in the 14, 15 years that follow as governments get more actively involved in this space, right? So when we look at what's happening today, there are still private companies that are very involved. Microsoft, for instance, has been kind of very actively identifying new strains of malware, reporting them to government entities in the United States and in other countries. Um, but there's also been a, a very significant coordinated effort on the part of many governments to provide assistance to Ukraine in terms of helping defend its critical infrastructure and networks, to provide guidance to private industry. And so I think there's also this moment that, that comes, you know, right around 2007, 2008, when people look at this response to the Estonian distributed denial of service tax and realize that if this is going to be a domain in which states are attacking other states, then the government is going to have to be a part of thinking about what response to that looks like and thinking about sort of how to protect themselves and how to protect other people and not just relying on the goodwill and, and the assistance of private sector entities to be able to recover from that and, and make progress. So I'm gonna skip a lot of time now because I'm 20 minutes in and, and I wanna get us up to today. Um, but if you go on to the next slide, right, there's, there's another wave of cyber attacks that come many years later 
um, out of Russia that, that really sort of start, I would say, around the 2015 um, moment, which are really focused on critical infrastructure and are focused on critical infrastructure in a much more sophisticated way than anything that we saw directed at Estonia in 2007. And what I mean by sophisticated, and I think that's a word that gets thrown around a lot in the cybersecurity space and is, is worth taking a minute to kind of think about and unpack. What I mean here is they are making use of vulnerabilities that people have not identified before, sometimes called zero day vulnerabilities, right? You're seeing exploitation of uh, technical bugs that nobody knew about. And, that makes these attacks, of course, much harder to defend against because you're learning about these vulnerabilities sort of as you're discovering and detecting the attack. So that's one thing that we sometimes say lends to the, the sophistication of an attack. The other thing that I think sort of differentiates these attacks on the Ukrainian electric grid from some of the previous Russian cyber capabilities is that they are very focused on sort of sabotage of critical infrastructure operations. Right, so the, the denial of service attacks that Estonia saw were very disruptive, they were very damaging, um, but they're also in some ways easy to execute. And by easy to execute, I mean that as long as you have enough computers compromised, as long as you've sort of got a large enough botnet, bombarding targets with malicious traffic is pretty easy, right? All you have to do is say to the computers you've compromised, send more traffic to these Estonian servers, send more traffic to these Estonian servers. It doesn't require a lot of technical talent. It doesn't require writing a lot of specialized code or finding a lot of new vulnerabilities or the things that we sort of associate with very advanced cyber capabilities. And what happens sort of in that 2015, 2016, 2017 moment is we start seeing cyber attacks come out of Russia that look a lot more sophisticated, that look like they exploit zero day vulnerabilities that people did not know about before that involve having written much more extensive, much more complicated kinds of malware to exploit those vulnerabilities and that are much more targeted, that are much more interested in sort of how can we get into the electric grid? How can we sort of access very particular kinds of critical infrastructure, uh, of critical infrastructure and sabotage that so that people won't have power, people won't have access to these essential services. And, and for many years, right, even before 2015, electric grids in the energy sector has been a source of real concern for people in the cybersecurity community because there's, there's a huge fear that this kind of infrastructure is very vulnerable, right? Often they are running legacy systems that are very difficult to update and can't be kind of easily or quickly patched. But there hasn't been up until this point, really any kind of large scale, certainly state sponsored attack on a uh, whole country's power grid. And so again, you see this sort of escalation of the kinds of cyber conflict that people have seen in practice, not the kinds that people have talked about. People have been talking about attacks on the electric grid for, for a while, even before this, but you see Russia go to a place that most other countries have not done, that has sort of been, been whispered about and worried about, but not actually happened. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty again, right? There's a recurring theme when we talk about cyber attacks over, is this really Russia? How do we know? How do we perform attribution? I mean, a lot of that attribution, I would say, kind of comes not at the time, right? Not, not right when the Ukrainian power grid has been compromised, but in the following years, as there are more kinds of cyber attacks coming out of this same group within the Russian government, and people start sort of focusing more on the similarities across the code bases they're seeing and the ways that some of the same techniques and tactics are being leveraged. And it becomes possible to kind of fit this in to a larger pattern of cyber attacks. And that, that I would say is also sort of an interesting and important takeaway here in which part of what, what's required, certainly for the kind of, the, the kind of deliberate and government backed attribution that you've seen around some of the Russian cyber attacks is time. Right, it takes time to be able to say, we know who did this, we, we feel really confident that we can say who wrote this code and who launched it. Um, and, and part of that is sort of having the time to witness other cyber attacks and put all of those together and, and fit this into a larger pattern. And the pattern that sort of really gives rise to the attribution of the attacks on Ukraine's power grid and many of the other 
sort of most consequential, most damaging cyber attacks of the past five years or so is the pattern set by this group in Russia that's sometimes referred to as Sandworm. Um, and this is, this is one of those incidents. This is a, a landmark in that it really kind of represents the targeting of critical infrastructure and becomes a little bit of a kind of accepted truth in cybersecurity circles that, oh, of course, you know, Russia can take out Ukraine's electric grid anytime they want. You may have read people writing about that at the beginning of this invasion. Of course, you know, Russia could could compromise the Ukrainian electric system, could manage to, to take out their power infrastructure if they wanted to. And, and part of what we're seeing now is some challenging of that wisdom, is people saying, well, you know, if, if that were really as easy right now as it was several years ago, wouldn't we have seen some elements of that? Wouldn't we expect that to have been kind of more a part of, of this invasion than it has been so far? And part of how this kind of continues to escalate is through a series of later attacks, especially in 2017. So if you go on to the next slide, um, Andy Greenberg, who's a journalist at Wired, who's done a lot of work looking at Sandworm, who wrote the book called Sandworm, um, and, and looking at Russian cyber attacks, starts covering some of the really massive cyber attacks coming out of Russia. I mean, in particular, looks at this NotPetya attack. Um, which he writes this article about the code that crashed the world. Um, and here, one of the things we start to see, and I think you see it in this headline and this Wired cover, are cyber attacks that are so much bigger than just one country in their impacts, right? And so everything I've sort of talked about so far has been, oh, here's a, a set of cyber attacks on Estonia. Here's a cyber attack on the Ukrainian electric grid. These are not necessarily super narrowly tailored attacks. But they are attacks that are kind of largely constrained within the borders of one country. And not Petra in 2017 is something much, much bigger than that. And it, you know, gets the attention of the whole world because it spreads so far beyond the borders of Ukraine. It does, to a certain extent, we think start in Ukraine. If you go on to the next slide, right, you see some of the, the very earliest targets that are being reported are, again, going to be Ukrainian energy companies. The initial distribution vector for NotPetya, for the malware, is through a Ukrainian accounting software, ME-DOC. So there's definitely some signs that it's targeting Ukraine or that it, its initial attempts to sort of spread are happening in Ukraine. And you see that also in terms of how many computers are infected in different countries. But the, the impacts are in no way limited to Ukraine. And this again comes up in the current conflict where you see a lot of countries, including the United States, including the United Kingdom and others, saying to their own businesses, banks, et cetera, you should, you should be worried not just about cyber attacks that might target us in retaliation for sanctions or other things. You should also be worried about cyber attacks that might not specifically target us, but might spread very quickly beyond the borders of Ukraine or beyond sort of the, the particular targets. If you go to the next slide, right, there are massive impacts of NotPetya. Um, the Maersk shipping company, right, is a big one. They have to shut down operations for a significant chunk of time, a couple of weeks. Merck, the pharmaceutical company based in the, uh, the United States, has to sort of suspend its vaccine manufacturing for a while because its systems are so compromised. Mondelez, the big multinational food company, has to stop operating for, again, a couple of weeks, right? There's, there are sort of just unbelievably far-reaching consequences of this malware, which, which starts in Ukraine, but spreads everywhere else. So if you go to the next slide, I, I pulled some of the statistics on sort of where the infections of NotPetya are. Um, and you can see that sort of, even though the largest percent of them are definitely based in Ukraine. And again, we think that's largely about sort of how the malware is being distributed, where the initial infection vectors are, are kind of most concentrated because there are so many connections, because there's so much sort of, uh, so, so much back and forth between computer systems at Ukrainian businesses or within the Ukrainian government and companies all over the world, you start to see this spreading really rapidly, first across Europe and then 
through to the rest of the world. I was I was living in uh, Rochester, New York at the time when NotPetya happened. And the local gas and electric company, RG&E, Rochester Gas and Electric, was impacted by this because their parent company was based in Spain and had been infected. And so there was sort of a really international component to this cyber attack in a way that we hadn't seen before, right? And again, when we sort of think about the landmarks of, of how Russia changes the norms for cyber conflict, how the, the ways in which they wield cyber capabilities escalate what we expect or what we, we view as accepted uh, practice in this space, you see sort of first the idea of a state targeting another state, going back to maybe 2007. Then you see a state targeting another state's critical infrastructure in 2015. And now in 2017, you see a state targeting not just one particular other state's critical infrastructure or resources, but the computing uh, capabilities of companies and government agencies across the entire world. The scale of it is sort of unlike anything anybody has ever seen. There are also some kind of interesting features in how not Petcha is designed that are a little bit confusing and a little bit striking to people. If you go to the next slide, I pulled some of the, the sort of text that shows on computers that are infected by not Petcha. It looks at sort of first glance like a ransomware attack, right? It looks like a, you know, sort of traditional financially motivated cybercrime, a ransom message saying send $300 worth of Bitcoin to the following address. Um, right, and, and these kinds of things that lead people at first to think maybe this isn't the Russian government, because why would the Russian government be sort of trying to make money in this way, like a common cyber criminal? But there are also some things about the implementation that then lead people back to saying this doesn't seem like cyber crime. This doesn't seem like it's been set up to receive money. So, for instance, if you go to the next slide, right, one of the things people pick up on very quickly with not Petcha is that the addresses where people are supposed to send money don't actually work, right? You can't actually reach any of the, the sort of people who are the accounts that are mentioned in the ransom notes. You can't actually make the transfers that are being asked for in a lot of these cases. So it looks like it's been kind of dressed up as cybercrime, perhaps in some sort of half-hearted attempt to make it not seem like a state-sponsored cyber attack, but in fact, the, the underlying infrastructure for a financially motivated cyber attack is, is really not there. There aren't ways to make these payments. There aren't ways to sort of um, contact the people who you would have to write to and say, please give me the decryption key so that I can unlock my systems now that I've paid the ransom. Nothing seems to have been set up here to, to kind of make you really believe that this was just a bunch of cyber criminals spreading malware. And in fact, that's a, that's a sort of perception that is much more heavily endorsed uh, several months later by a whole bunch of governments that sort of coordinate their response to this and release formal attribution statements, sort of akin to what you saw from the Estonian government in 2007. If you go to the next slide, uh, here's the UK government saying this was the Russian military. Right. This is, you know, we, we've done our assessment. We've looked at all the evidence. We've looked at all the intelligence. Um, and we found that the Russian military was almost certainly responsible for the NotPetya cyber attack of June 2017. And I would just again flag for you, this is a statement that's being made in February of 2018. This is a statement that sort of requires several months of assessment and gathering evidence and coordinating with other governments. Um, if you go to the next slide, you see sort of the similar statement coming out that same week from the U.S. government saying um, the Russian military launched the most destructive. Oh, sorry, we're going the wrong direction. Go to the next slide after this one. Um, here you go. So here's the statement from the White House press secretary. And these are these are only two of several countries it's sort of in the span of a week that are getting together and saying, this was Russia. This was the Russian government that launched not Petya. Um, White House says in June 2017, the Russian military launched the most destructive and costly cyber attack in history. And I think part of what I would sort of flag about this aftermath is that you're seeing a, a pretty coordinated effort by a whole bunch of different countries to try and, and tamp down on uncertainty, to try and say, you know, we know who did this, and we want this to be kind of established fact 
We don't want everybody to have to be running around all the time saying, well, you know, allegedly Russia was behind this or did this thing. We want people to sort of recognize that a particular country was behind this attack and that this was something really damaging and really sort of unlike what we've seen before in terms of state-based cyber conflict. Um, and if you if you go on to the next slide, I would just say sort of quickly so we can we can get to some discussion of what's happening right now. You continue to see some of this formal attribution coming in cyber attacks that are launched at Georgia uh, in 2020 and trying to sort of say, you know, there's there's no doubt in the minds of all of the countries that have looked at these attacks and sort of studied the code and studied how they were distributed, that this was not just sort of Russian hackers behind this, but something led by the Russian military intelligence agencies um, that took out, in this case, websites and interrupted television broadcasts um, that, that was really sort of focused on communications networks and media outlets in this particular case. Um, I think if you go to the next slide, right, you see another sort of story about the attribution process here. Um, and I would, I would say, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of reliance, I would say a lot of reliance on what we sometimes call naming and shaming in this space, right? The idea that if you coordinate some of this attribution and you say this was Russia and they were behind it, um, that that will perhaps help deter from deter Russia or deter other countries from launching similar attacks in the future. There's a whole sort of world in research drawn from kind of the studies of the Cold War and nuclear deterrence that looks at the question of, is it possible to sort of effectively deter countries from launching cyber attacks? What does that even mean in a space where attribution is so complicated and so uncertain? And part of what I think the, the past 10, 15 years of cyber attacks has been about is trying to codify a little bit the attribution process and, and sort of watching governments around the world try to turn that into something a little bit more formal and a little bit more recognized to undermine the idea that in cyberspace attribution is impossible and it can't be done and nobody really knows with any certainty who was behind anything. It is still true, and I think you're seeing this now in the in the current climate, that attribution can be slow, that attribution can take time uh, to, do, to do effectively, and that one of the concerns, I think, sort of in the early days, perhaps pre-invasion of Ukraine in particular, when the tensions were rising, when there was a lot of concern about invasion, um, but there wasn't yet a uh, clear military conflict, was how much pressure would there be to perform really rapid attribution of cyber attacks. If you go to the next slide, right, one thing that I think is, is striking about some of the early stages of the Russia-Ukraine conflict is how, how much more cyber activity there perhaps was pre-invasion. Um, so we saw in February a series of cyber attacks that were targeting Ukrainian government websites, Ukrainian banks. Um, these included just sort of standard defacement attacks where websites were pulled down or graffitied or replaced with other texts. Um, they also included some of this uh, kind of data wiping software where Ukrainian government agencies had data that they were storing just deleted off of their machines and then, then had to go back and and restore them. You didn't see anything on par with the attacks on the electric grid, the idea of sort of actually disrupting the operation of critical infrastructure, but you did see a fair bit of this kind of lower level cyber activity that was aimed at disruption, aimed at kind of making it hard to organize, hard to distribute information, hard to operate the financial infrastructure of the country. Um, and, and you also see a fair bit of kind of cautiousness around the attribution here. And again, I would say I think that's largely about time, largely about governments, including the Ukrainian government, wanting to be a little bit careful about how quickly uh, they cast blame over this and how, how sort of fast they move to say we know exactly who was behind this um, and, and what was going on. And some of that was just that this was not, for the most part, very difficult stuff to do, right? This was the kind of distributed denial of service attack that you saw being launched against Estonia, 
in 2007. This was not the sort of very sophisticated targeted code that you saw from Russia in 2015, 2016, 2017. And because of that, I think there was also some concern that this could be anybody, right? This wouldn't have to be the Russian government. This wouldn't have to be sort of a really sophisticated threat actor in this space. Um, so there's, there's some uncertainty kind of in February over, well, do we know for sure that this is really Russia behind these attacks? Um, if you go to the next slide where right, I pulled another headline in which you sort of see some Ukrainian officials saying, we think this could be Russia. We haven't sort of formally uh, attributed this yet. We're, we're not 100% sure, but we definitely are seeing kind of uh, a repeated onslaught of cyber attacks targeting Ukrainian government websites in particular and Ukrainian financial institutions. At the same time that that is happening, as the conflict is, is escalating, as other countries are getting more involved and sort of making more public statements about what they think is going to happen, about the intelligence they've gathered, you also see other countries issuing warnings to businesses. Um, so in the United States, if you go to the next slide, right, you see the Department of Homeland Security, which operates the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency here, Announcing, especially to financial institutions, banks in the country, um, we think we think you should be ready for sort of aggressive cyber attacks from Russia. We think something either specifically targeting the U.S. because of sanctions, or perhaps just more broadly spreading across the entire world, like NotPetya, could be coming, and we want we want you to be prepared for that. What I would flag about these warnings, what I think is striking about them at the time and still striking about them now, is that they do not feature any of the sort of specificity that you see in some of the other uh, kind of intelligence briefings or, or reports out of the United States about what Russia is going to do, right? There's no clear sense of, you know, here's what we think is coming and here's how to prepare yourself. It's a very broad sort of, you know, we think we think something might happen and we want you to ramp up protections and make sure that you're ready for it. Um, and, and because everybody is on such heightened alert for cyber attacks from Russia, there's a lot of focus on each new discovery, each new detection. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's a set of wiper malware that's that's uh, identified in the, just in the past couple of weeks. Microsoft finds the Foxblade malware, a set of researchers at ESET find the Caddy Wiper malware. So there are sort of strains of malware that we see, uh, we think coming out of Russia, we think sort of linked to, linked to trying to delete data, maybe from Ukrainian websites, maybe from websites around the world. What we don't see, and it's a, a pretty striking absence given what we've seen in the past from Russia, are any of these wiper malware programs that are actually able to spread really effectively and really rapidly, right? Because when you think about NotPetya, what's damaging, what's scary about NotPetya is that it spreads across networks, across computer systems all over the world really, really rapidly before people have a chance to patch their systems, before people have a chance to kind of disconnect from the infected devices. And none of the new strains of wiper malware, at least that we've seen so far, have exhibited anything like that ability to exploit a uh, vulnerability that can, can sort of put them on millions of machines across the world. And unless you have access to those kinds of vulnerabilities, unless there's a stockpile of, of bugs that you can exploit that are actually present in all or many of the key systems around the world, then it's really hard to distribute even a very effective piece of wiper malware because you can't get it onto all of the computers that you would need to to have a really significant impact. Um, and so, so there's a lot of interest in these new kinds of malware that we're seeing out of Russia in the past couple of weeks, but there's also nothing like the impact of the wiper malwares that we've seen in previous years, of the, the stuff that sort of really cost billions of dollars and spread worldwide. Um, there's also a lot of interest in sort of who is behind the cyber attacks on all sides of this conflict. If you go to the next slide, um, a lot of the kind of reporting on this has, has focused on this idea that you've got independent volunteers, independent hacker groups, groups like Anonymous getting involved in this space, um, launching denial of service attacks or leaking stolen data or defacing websites. 
Um, and that's not entirely new, not entirely unusual. Right, as I say, going back to the Estonia Russia conflict in 2007, you've had interest in, in sort of some sense that there are independent hackers involved and in, in kind of perhaps playing some role at least in launching these types of attacks. It's a little bit unusual, though, again, compared to some of the more recent, uh, more sophisticated attacks that we've seen out of Russia in this domain. And I think, again, speaks to the sense that a lot of what's happening in cyberspace here is relatively amateurish, is relatively easy for even, you know, people without a huge amount of resources or a lot of time to devote to this to be able to insert themselves into and, and have some impact. And that's not to say, again, that it's, it's not destructive and it's not disruptive, because many of these cyber attacks definitely are. It's just to say that it's not the kind of cyber capability that you would spend years developing. It's the kind of cyber attacks that sort of somebody who had a somewhat casual passing interest in this space would be able to copy and paste some code from the internet and, and run and do a little damage, but not necessarily have very far reaching impacts. So I wanna wrap up and, and leave some time for questions. I'll just sort of say by way of conclusion, if you look, if you move on to the next slide, right, you're getting to this point where people are saying, this is not so impressive. This is not the kind of thing we would have expected out of Russia, or not the kind of thing we were expecting a month or two ago out of Russia. Here's Farhad Manju in the New York Times um, writing an opinion piece saying, well, the Ukrainian cyber war, that wasn't, right? We were also ready for this to be a, a huge cyber conflict and instead, it was kind of nothing. Um, if you go to the next slide, you have a group of researchers who are writing in the Washington Post about the invasion of Ukraine, saying Putin's invasion of Ukraine didn't rely on cyber warfare. Here's why, right? We, we've, these are people who do research that suggests it's not actually a sort of super effective way to conclude or, or win wars. Um, and so I think what I would say is you're seeing some reevaluation right now certainly in the academic community and perhaps in the international security community as well, of what is the value of these types of cyber capabilities? Should we expect to see more and more and more of them moving forwards as we perhaps once did? Or in fact, are we seeing a little bit of a, a pullback from that, a little bit of a return to more traditional forms of warfare and conflict and less reliance on cyber capabilities than we might've expected to? Um, if you look at the next slide, right, I gave you sort of a couple of different interpretations that we've seen in, in some of the news and discourse around the invasion of Ukraine for why there haven't been more cyber attacks, why sort of we haven't seen anything more sophisticated or more effective yet. Um, one, is, one is just to say, you know, look, we don't think Russia planned or prepared for this attack very well. And that's something people have said about many of the different dimensions of the invasion. And perhaps that's true of the cyber capabilities, too. Perhaps they didn't have things kind of prepared and ready to go that would really help, that would really allow them to target Ukraine in some of the ways that they have in the past. Um, earlier on, I would say in the conflict, there were some people who said, you know, I think this might have been because Russia didn't want to escalate things with other countries. They didn't want to have a not petcha where a whole bunch of other countries were sort of affected and, and got involved. I think that's less plausible now than it was maybe a month or two ago when fewer countries were kind of actively engaged in the first place. At this point, it's not clear that a cyber attack like that Petra would really escalate that involvement so much beyond where it already is, but it's certainly one of the explanations you've heard. Um, there's, been, there's been a theory that you've seen from some researchers that sort of the, the cyber dimensions of conflict are most useful or most effective prior to an actual kind of traditional conflict that once you have uh, tanks and soldiers on the ground, the cyber stuff is kind of more peripheral anyway. And that may be right, but it doesn't explain why you haven't seen more of these attacks kind of intended to reinforce and bolster the traditional conflict, which I think continues to be a, a question people have trouble answering, especially if they take sort of as a given that Russia had the capabilities to do something like shut off Ukraine's electric grid or interfere with their communications networks. Um, there's also been a theory, which I think, you know, seems less plausible as more time goes by, that Russia had a lot of cyber capabilities, but sort of holding them in reserve to see if they need them, right? That maybe initially they thought this would be a, a quick invasion and a resounding triumph and they wouldn't need to rely too much on cyber capabilities. 
I again think that's a harder argument to support as this as this war continues to go on and as it kind of clearly is not a, a quick or an easy win for Russia. Um, and another theory that I would just flag because it's come up is this idea that you know maybe it was a deliberate choice to leave Ukrainian critical infrastructure and communications networks up and running so that people around the world would be able to see what was happening in Ukraine, would be able to sort of see a resounding Russian victory there. Um, and again, I think that's a, a theory that's sort of less plausible and it makes less sense as this drags on longer and longer and points me back towards that first interpretation more and more, which is maybe there wasn't preparation here. Maybe there weren't sort of sophisticated cyber weapons ready to go or prepared for this conflict. And there was therefore kind of no, nothing to turn to besides these less impressive pieces of wiper malware or distributed denial of service attacks as things continued to, to advance. Um, if you go to the next slide, I will say, you know, I think there are a lot of things that have surprised people here and that we can't quite explain, even with those interpretations I've just suggested. Um, the idea that sort of you just don't see the cyber attacks that are being used to target the power infrastructure, to target the communications networks, even as you do see uh, physical attacks on that infrastructure, right? You see Russian military trying to go after TV towers, trying to go after um, power plants, right? Things that you might have assumed or might have expected would be more effective and easier to do with cyber capabilities you instead see being done with, with traditional forces in ways that suggest the cyber capabilities may just not be there or may not be effective. Um, the fairly sort of unsophisticated ways that cyber capabilities that are being exercised are targeting Ukrainian websites and databases, I think is very striking, very surprising to a lot of people who have been holding Russia in, in fairly high regard as a significant sort of cyber power in this space. The fact that the, the cyber attacks we have seen are, are fairly narrow in scope, really don't go beyond the borders of Ukraine, right? Which could be interpreted as Russia deliberately trying to avoid cyber conflict with other countries, um, but could also be related to the fact that they don't have the vulnerabilities that they would need stockpiled to launch another really widespread cyber attack. Um, and much less willingness or much less ability to cause any kind of widespread disruption by targeting uh, critical infrastructure than we've seen out of Russia in the past. So I think going to my last slide, sort of some of the key takeaways here so far, right, with the, with the caveat again, that this is very much a kind of changing and evolving situation, have to do with the idea that for Russia and perhaps for other countries as well, cyber conflict is actually much less fully integrated into kind of traditional military conflicts than we perhaps previously thought. And this idea that all wars, wars kind of going forward will be hybrid, that cyber will be a key component of all of them, seems a little less kind of concretely supported by this invasion than the idea that cyber is maybe helpful before a conflict or around the edges, but is not clearly a central part, at least of this conflict. Um, and going along with that, this idea that as physical violence escalates, as you see sort of more and more traditional warfare, the cyber components seem to diminish in importance um, and, and perhaps are even difficult to kind of sustain if you are in the midst of a traditional conflict, then also keeping up the infrastructure, keeping up the ability to launch cyber attacks may be difficult to do. Um, and then finally, this sense that sort of the cost calculus is different than we perhaps thought of it, right? And that Russia, which has been pretty widely regarded as one of the most sophisticated and advanced countries when it comes to cyber capabilities, seems to be finding it easier or cheaper or more effective to target communications networks and critical infrastructure in Ukraine with physical forces, with military uh, sort of troops on the ground than with digital tactics, I think is telling about how difficult, how slow, how expensive these capabilities actually are to develop, even in the countries where there have been quite a lot of resources thrown at them and this sense that they are still not at the stage of being able to replace military action with those cyber capabilities. So I'm gonna stop there. If you go to the next slide, um, I haven't left as much time as I meant to for questions and comments, but I would, I would love to hear from some of you. Yes, we have uh, questions in the list. So the question is, how to solve the issue of achieving consensus among the 27 EU member states? 
So only a few member states have this attribution capabilities and uh, political will to share information with others. Uh, but the uh, prerequisite is that uh, we can offer the sanctions only when we have um, the who is attacking us or we have the malicious intent. Uh, the US is also sharing technical information only with few trusted allies. How to solve the challenges that uh, for the credible attribution states must show better hand evidence than IP address because false uh, flag ops are common. Yeah, it's a great question. Sort of what do you do about attribution when the forensic evidence needed to perform attribution is so hard and so expensive to come by, right? You need massive intelligence operations. Um, and, and when we look at sort of how attribution has been done by countries like the United States in the past, a lot of it is, is really not just based on IP addresses. A lot of it is we've actually sort of gotten inside some of the Russian military networks and established these people wrote this code in this repository at this time, right? And if you look at some of the indictments that have been issued against Russian military officers, you see really granular sort of, you know, this person wrote this piece of the NotPetya malware and sent it to these particular people on this day. I um, mean, I think that's the kind of evidence that, that you would probably need and want right to say this is this is really kind of credible attribution and exactly as you say sort of not relying just on ip addresses i think the only way to sort of do that more broadly across more states is to have either public dissemination of that intelligence or more privileged sharing of it um, and as you say sort of the us hasn't always been willing to share that very widely beyond the five eyes countries i do think you're seeing more willingness not just from the United States, um, but from many countries to share intelligence a little bit more broadly in the context of this invasion, in the context of cyber attacks more generally. But I don't think there's any way around the idea that sort of it doesn't make sense for every single EU member state to have an intelligence operation that is sort of that deep into the, the sort of nitty gritty of what's happening in Russian military agencies there has to be some way to sort of share that information and allow for it to be spread across those states, which doesn't require them all to replicate those same capabilities. Mm -hmm. Then the another question is about Ukraine authorities, because the internet has been down and uh, attacks against Viasat uh, have caused huge loss of communication uh, attributed to Russia. How do you view these efforts uh, of Russia? Can Russia attack Western uh, critical infra uh, and under what condition as uh, retaliation for sanctions? So another really great question. Um, I think my understanding of some of the internet outages in Ukraine is that they've been fairly sort of short in terms of their duration um, and that the ones that have lasted longer have largely been because of physical attacks on infrastructure and on the, the towers and cables that are being used to carry traffic. Um, I think there's no question that sort of targeting critical infrastructure and communications networks is incredibly damaging, is incredibly destructive in the context of this conflict. I do think that there is some reassurance to me in the fact that the way that Russia has been able to do that most effectively is actually through physical attacks and suggests to me that Ukraine has done fairly well at trying to harden its own networks and infrastructure against cyber attacks. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways of compromising these networks. I think a Russian cyber attack on Western critical infrastructure, we don't know what the response would look like. From, from the United States, from other Western countries, um, because we haven't seen anything really like that. The closest we've seen is probably not Pecha, which was an attack with massive consequences, but was perhaps not exactly an attack on critical infrastructure. Um, I think if Russia chose to escalate in that way, you probably would see much more aggressive response in the cyber domain. But it would also be somewhat unexpected at this point because Russia has gone so long now without launching any kind of sophisticated cyber attack. Um, and, and so it would have to be something that they were really sort of holding in reserve and waiting and waiting to see if they had to do. Um, but it, it's certainly possible. It's certainly something that people in, in all of these countries are thinking about and worrying about. 
and I'm sure coming up with scenarios for sort of what the appropriate response would be. Is there an expectation of increased threat of cyber attacks now where the things are not going as planned for uh, Russia and maybe even specifically after the war ends? So I think two weeks ago, the answer would have been yes, right? That sort of the worse things get for Russia on the ground, the more they're going to rely on cyber attacks, the more this is going to escalate in cyberspace. And now I'm less sure. Now I'm honestly, you know, we, we still haven't seen that. So it's always possible that at any point there's going to be a, an arsenal of cyber weapons let loose. But I, I become more skeptical as time goes by because I think, you know, you're already seeing that things aren't going as planned and you're not seeing that that kind of compensatory cyber escalation. Um, so after the war ends, you know, certainly I think it's possible that Russia could decide we're going to really double down on cyber capabilities and and retaliate that way. But I don't know, because I also think it's possible you could interpret this as they've lost a lot of their technical talent. They haven't been investing in those capabilities in the way that they were even three or four years ago. And perhaps this is this is not where they have sort of decided to show their strength anymore. Um, in my university, people are talking about a lot about trolls. So in on one hand, we teach students that you have to be nice and good online. Then we tell them that don't trust nobody and trolls are not humans. But the first time when you meet the troll, there seems like a real person, but they lure you in. Uh, what, uh, what the government should tell the youth and commoners about uh, the information war? Because in currently only the informatics teachers and scientists are uh, teaching the society. And the problem is that uh, the students, because they want to act and they can't, they just open up the website who is doing the DDoS and they feel that they can do something to contribute <laughs> to end the world war. So what the government should tell to the society that how we should behave in, because they are not talking to us in that huh. matter. So it's a, it's a really interesting and important question. I don't know that I have the, the perfect answer. I think you know, often the the advice around online trolls is sort of disengage, or certainly in the United States, a lot of the effort has been, you know, don't don't pay attention to the information that they're posting, flag that as disinformation, or flag these as fake accounts, and and try to kind of make it so fewer people see them and fewer people interact with them online. I will tell you, I do not think we've had a lot of success with that strategy. And I think if you look at a lot of the big social media companies, um, they are still really struggling with sort of what should we be doing in this space and how do we do this more effectively? I think that sort of trying to teach people of all ages, right? You know, from children on up to senior citizens, about how to recognize manipulative or disingenuous behavior in cyberspace, what some of the signs of, of trolling are in online spaces and how to avoid it or disengage with it when you encounter it is always valuable, but it's never 100% effective. Um, and I think that sort of the more that you can have open conversations in the context of universities, in the context of schools and workplaces about what does trolling look like and what's an effective way to sort of not, not spend too much time or energy dealing with it, but also not get sucked into it and, and end up sort of involved in online conflicts that you don't wanna be part of um, is still, still really important. It's not a solution by any means, but I do think it's a, an important first step. Maybe the message should be like uh, uh, from the internet hero to the internet troll is only a few steps. That's a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the time and the talk. Uh, thank you for the US Embassy and all the participants who were uh, listening to us today. And uh, please feel free to share the world and the new knowledge that you gained today with others as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here. <laughs>